just some disclaimers. This is not a how-to lecture, how to do this, how to develop an apologetic ministry. Uh, this is our story. It started with a program, I'll tell you kind of the story, how things developed, how doors opened, and ELF was very instrumental in making this happen, and it also became kind of a model for, for moving things on, and things have developed, and then the online, the, the media and online aspects can become part of this. So um, it's going to be a little bit of a history. It's also going to be a little bit kind of theological reflection on the importance of apologetics and then some application questions where you can re challenge you to reflect on some, some issues that, that could be relevant for yourself. So, so feel free to, to find what might be relevant for you. Well, First, the background story, because we're seeing an emergence of a Norwegian apologetics movement, uh, which started actually here at LF, uh, ELF. We were several people sitting at the airport, so happy with being at uh, ELF, and should we do something together in Norway for apologetics? We were all evangelicals, we were all into apologetics, we were all concerned about well, Norway, evangelization, and also about strengthening Christians. Um, so we found together, and uh, this has been the background for what we are seeing now in the uh, apologetic movement. We have a shared evangelical commitment, which kind of is the theological background, so you don't have these theological uh, discussions and divisions. Uh, you have a united vision for apologetics and inspiration from ELF, along with the Labri Fellowship, with the UCSCF in, in the United Kingdom, and the OCA in, in Oxford. So, so this has been part of our history, and we brought this into this new uh, uh, movement. So, so from this, we have a <coughs> gradual development of a bigger integrative strategy for apologetics in Norway. Uh, and we can see with, there are five key elements to our story and to what is, is um, the kind of the backbone bone of this, um, uh, what has happened with us. And this shouldn't be a model for everyone. This is our story. Uh, and you can learn from it maybe w w what things could strengthen your context. Uh, we all have a unique context, unique abilities, unique arenas and callings. Um, but this is where we started. So we all started with a, with at, at an LA University College with an academic course called Communication, Worldviews, and Christian Apologetics Program. It's an apologetic program that's put in the setting of the bigger understanding of communication of the Christian faith in a time where there are multiple worldviews. We call it a missionary training for people who stay at home. Our own country, our own neighborhood, are missionary fields. So that was kind of starting in 2001, uh, and it's, it's kind of a, a humble start for a, for a course in communication. But this has, by God's grace, been growing. And we have lots of people now in Norway that are so enthusiastic about having done this course. Some of them are leaders in the, some of the organizations. Um, and this has inspired them and, and made them, uh, uh, inspired them to, to do in the work in their own callings. Now, the second, uh, the second step in, in this uh, story was developing of uh, an, an organization called the Mars Norway, communicating with a wider Christian constituency. Well, you, in the academia, you can be sitting in the ivory tower just doing research or just teaching a few students. We thought it would be important to reach out and make these resources. We, we, we saw this was so helpful to our students. How can we make these resources available for, for more people? Well, we had an organization called Damaris Norway established from 2003. Uh, you might know that the name Damaris comes from the Bible, 
From Acts 17, we've been mentioning Paul's speech to the Athenians. One of the listeners there was a lady. She must be very influential because it says she and the Dionysus was converted there. Um, and and re the reason we use that name is we, we use the model of Paul's speech in Athens and when we're thinking about apologetics and communication. We want to relate to people's stories. Paul doesn't refer to the Old Testament, which he always done, does when he's preaching to Christians or Jews. He just refers to their philosophers, their poets, right? But he tells a Christian story. He challenges them. He invites them, intrigues them, points them to Jesus. So being able to listen to culture, make use of it, asking questions and challenging, and then bringing Jesus into the discussion. Now, Paul seemed to maybe to be interrupted in the end when he brought up Jesus and the resurrection, but he managed to spark interest, and we know even some people were converted maybe after some more conversation after, after this speech. But we, we when we uh, explain what Damaris Norway uh, is, we call it a strategic hub for networking, cultural apologetics, and community, community engagement. It offers worldview analysis of cultural stories and products in order to develop resources for churches, schools, and the wider society with double listening to the world and to the world as a characteristics feature. So you might understand that the Damaris Norway is reflecting what we're doing in the communication and world use program, which allows us to be academics while still using our time with this organization. When this, this organization and platforms gives us also opportunities to reach many more people. Um, and then the second step on, this, on our journey was uh, developing or, or establishing uh, an uh, apologetic journal. 2009, and then it became an academic journal in 2012, accredited journal, uh, and then fully open access in 2020, quite, quite recently. So as an uh, academic institution, it's wonderful to reach the wider uh, constituency, right, with the Mars Norway organization, but then we need to be committed to research, and Theophilus was this journal that, that we created in this uh, context, which now serves the whole NLA University College, which has four campuses. We were the smallest campus. We were the only campus when we merged who had this, um, this uh, journal, academic journal. Um, which is on, uh, on apologetics. Then, fourth step of this road happened in 2013, um, when we had met in 2012 here at the ELF and discussing what we could do together. So, the NLA with the Communication Worldview Program, that was us, uh, along with Damaris Norway, that's also us. We, we uh, work together with Norwegian Student Movement. They have young people across Norway, schools and universities, and then a local Bible school. And the principal has been, has been here, inspired, and the same vision both for in terms of theology and apologetics. And they had a wonderful venue. If they use it, it's free, <laughs> right? The Student Movement had connections across Europe. We had content we want to spread. We study apologetics and communication. So we think this was a kind of a, not a wedding, it's just a union made in heaven, where God made it happen. And we have different things to co contribute, and now we've been going on 10 years, right? And this has developed. And from this, many new things develop, which is relevant to, to media. The conference is not kind of a media event, well, going to be some streaming, just like here. But let's see, there's some partnership initiatives developed from this conference or from the cooperation behind the conference. Well, first, it's the Veritas imprint. We 
want to publish apologetics quality books. In Norway, that's very hard because we're very few people, few Christians, few Christians who read, even fewer who read apologetics books. Right. So how are we going to do this? Well, if we have a conference, we can get a kind of a very good first push on promotion of the book, and then we can develop resources around the book, and we can make the book sell at least enough to break even so our publisher doesn't hurt, right? So we're working with it. We are not the publisher. We're just an imprint under a publisher, so we need to make this uh, break even economically. But this, um, uh, the conference made this possible. So when we invite speakers, we invite speakers who have produced books, and very often it's some, some English speaker. We translate one book every year, and the speaker is there, and he can be promoting uh, this book. Um, uh, okay, the Veritas imprint, I don't know the number of books, maybe 15 or 20 books until now, which has made a really big difference. Now we have apologetics resources. It's not just come and listen to us, we have a lecture, but go and, go and look. And you need this book when you talk to non-Christians. It's not enough just to, to scroll the web or listen to YouTube. You need something to hold in your hand, some way you can check the, the, the sources, and something you can give to your friend. So we think this is important media aspect, right? It's uh, making apologetics into the print, printed version. We shouldn't leave that um, on the side. That's an important element of, of our vision for apologetics. And then in the same year, we started the Veritas seed funding. Uh, we're just kind of starting to invite people to, to join us in our vision, to strengthen uh, Christians, especially in, their, uh, in, in apologetics. So this uh, funding allows us to, to support different kind of projects, communication projects, apologetics projects. Um, um, yeah, could be very different kind of things. It could be media projects, it could be videos linked to a book, it could be uh, doing a book, it could be inviting speakers. Uh, we're kind of free to, to reflect on what's most strategic for us. And then, in 2018, we had John Lennox um, uh, as uh, the, the main speaker. He's very well known, and he really made a big difference in, in creating interest for the conference. And uh, that gave us an opportunity to create events outside the conference. Uh, that was lectures in Oslo and Kristiansand in, in the secular university with packed auditoriums, uh, where he spoke about science and faith and has science made uh, religion superfluous, uh, and and uh, from there we create the idea of veritas public events that was uh, were apologetics, and we can also arrange debates um, in this setting, right? And then the same year we started something called the veritas research symposium. Being an academic institution, we have to be committed to do research. And Veritas gave us a platform to invite people. Uh, and the first year, we had John Lennon coming over, and that was a, a wonderful opportunity for us to, to, to set the issue of natural theology, science, on the agenda. And we uh, published one sp special uh, issue of Theophilus based on all the contribution from that. So, um, uh, this year, it's going to be on C.S. Lewis. Uh, uh, we have Alistair McGrath from the UK coming over. He's a specialist on C.S. Lewis. And we're going to have a symposium just ahead of the conference, starting to, to invite people to publish uh, on this topic. And then, in 2019, we um, established Veritas Norway Association. Well. We were a small group localized in the south of Norway. We were thinking, well, we need to think bigger in Norway. We need to get further out, further. More people need this. 
And when we are around in churches and, and uh, different places, we see people are very interested in apologetics. It's been a big difference the last 20 years. Churches are, are kind of waking up to this need, and especially young people, they're desperate for it. So uh, Veritas Norway Association is a kind of a, an umbrella here to coordinate and create synergies for Christian apologetics work in Norway by sharing the gospel, strengthening Christians, and shaping culture. We have many good Christian churches, Christian organizations in Norway. Almost all of them have a weakness in apologetics. They have different strengths. Some are charismatic, some are very dogmatic, some are very socially focused. But most of them, they, they lack this apologetics aspect. And we want to bring uh, our unique contribution to, to Norway. So we have this umbrella uh, which can help us do this. Well, we think this is just amazing what God has opened up for us. We walked into this expecting a small conference and see, lo and behold, all of these things showed up and filling different kind of needs, different, different kind of um, possibilities as well. Now, just some reflection on, uh, on some principles on developing <laughs> apologetics ministry because what we see as apologetics is really crucial here. Very often, our perspective on what apologetics is is getting too narrow. And uh, when we do, when we think and research on this, uh, one of the big issues for us is putting apologetics in a bigger context. So, some key theological principles. Well, first, the first principle is that Christian apologetics is integral to the mission of the church. It's not some, some, something you can do if, you, if you're especially interested, if you have intellectuals in the church, or if you're interested in atheists. Apologetics is for all Christians. And it's very interesting that it's Peter the lay person who had struggling to read Paul's letters, he says, be always prepared for defense when anyone challenges you for the hope you have, right? So it's a calling for everyone, and it's a calling that has been neglected because of our history. We have had the success of the Christian faith in Norway. We're celebrating next year 1,000 years of Christian law in Norway. And we have a state church, so we, we haven't had the need to defend too much. But now states and church are separating, which is quite fortunate in many ways. But it's also a big issue with secularization. People not know what Christianity is about, more estranged from Christianity. So, so um, we need to um, reach out. Uh, to meet the new generation. Uh, we need apologetics to explain and defend the Christian faith. Uh, I really find the, 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 the call for Christian mission from the Cape Town commitment. We have mentioned Lausanne several times. And this is a, a one sentence in this Cape Town commitment calling us to bear witness we're not manipulating. We're not making people Christians, right? We are bearing witness to someone else. It's quite helpful taking out the temptation of manipulation and force that sometimes the associations with apologetics has with it. That defending it sounds military. Well, it's actually legal. It's a legal context, the term. And we should um, get that back into our minds. So we are bearing witness to Jesus Christ and all his teaching. And then you have three dimensions in all nations, that's again the, the cross-cultural missions perspective, and all spheres of society, that's the broad perspective. All spheres of society needs to know Jesus Christ. And then you have the third element, which is especially relevant to apologetics, and in the realm of ideas. How people think is so essential. And it's how they think that leads to how they act. So uh, we need to be there asking them questions, understanding the idea, analyzing the ideas, and then also bringing 
Christian faith into um, these realms of ideas, which is very often secular. Then the second uh, theological an apologetic um, um, commitment uh, is seeing apologetics as both a science and an art. Science is kind of the theoretical side. We have research. We need that. But not all Christians are scientists, right? Not all are philosophers. Apologetics is also a practical art of actually explaining the faith, right, and answering questions. We're all practitioners. In this sense, we're all apologists. We're all missionaries, we're all apologists. And apologetics is, a, is also a very practical thing of sharing the faith and then responding to questions when they come. If questions come, that's our golden opportunity. Maybe Sometimes we need to think that it's, it's our lives that make people ask us questions. When we're maybe too easy, uh, eager to answer. So we need to keep both those aspects kind of, uh, in, in focus. Uh, we need people who dig deep, and we need the practitioners, practitioners. And we need to make the connection between them. So help the practitioners do something that's healthy and valid and sound, that, that stands scrutiny, right? Sometimes you give two easy arguments and people examine them, they fall. We need to make sure that our apologetics is um, holding water. Okay, this is the third conviction or perspective here from apologetics is that it, it, you can say that it has a dual approach and Margaret mentioned that in, in her uh, uh, earlier lecture as well. We can, we have first the closed fist. That is the kind of classical understanding of Christian apologetics. And the closed fist is not aggression. It's not the, the fighting fist. It's the asserting fist. We actually believe this. There are good reasons for believing in God. And the Bible is reliable. You can trust it. Check Check the facts. This is true. Come and check us. But then I think this has been kind of the classical apologetic tradition that we also have been a part of, the intellectual side which had been neglected by the church. I think we need to rediscover the other side as well, which is a kind of part of actually the classical apologetic uh, history, uh, which Os Guinness pointed out. We have the tradition of the open hand, the creative, inviting hand, using rhetoric and imagination. <coughs> and and uh, we need to be able to handle both. When, when people are not interested, it's not, it's not helping to give them more arguments, right? We need to be created to interest people, make them interested. And then creativity comes in, and rhetoric using imagination. So the, the, the big perspective for the Veritas conference this year keeps this perspective of reason and imagination from C.S. Lewis kind of in a balance. We want to bring in the tradition from C.S. Lewis, which links to the older Christian tradition as well. We need to respect and understand the role of imagination, how that works on people, how that can be used for opening people for faith, of course, we should also understand how imagination can hurt faith and bring people away from faith. But uh, we should see uh, this dual approach in apologetics, both having good, solid arguments and then being creative, have the open hand, inviting people to examine. The, the fourth principle here is uh, thinking about Christian apologetics in the, in the kind of the wider context here is um, that it has a role in three different contexts. And uh, Lars wrote an article about this, reflecting on the bigger role of apologetics and pointed out in terms of evangelism. We can say that apologetics has different roles on different stages in evangelism. It has a role in pre-evangelism. 
in answering and agenda setting. Before people are open for the gospel, they have lots of, of questions, lots of myths, ideas, prejudices that need to be taken away. So there is a role for pre-evangelism, a place where you haven't yet stated the gospel, but you need to clear the way. That's also a, a place for, for uh, creative media, for making, for example, movies that make people ask the questions that evangelists, Christians, can link into, right? So pre-evangelism is really very important. And we as Christians in the media, we can help set the agenda for the questions that we know are important and that should be asked. And then we come to evangelism. We know what that is. That's sharing the good news about Jesus. And that evangelism should be persuasive. It should be based on good arguments, not just on emotion. Um, it's true, and that's the reason you should become a Christian. It's not because you're afraid of the future or the dark place or whatever, or you want to go to heaven. The reason you should believe it is because it's true. And then you need to clarify, but also it's about commending. The gospel is not just true. It's good and it's beautiful. And we need to, uh, apologetics need to discover that fact about Jesus as well. He's not just the truth. He's the beauty. And uh, the more we meditate and examine him, we can discover that. And that needs to be part of apologetics as well. Um, commending Jesus. Not just, his, he's a very good man. He's a deep philosopher. He actually rose from the dead. But no, he, he offers life. His teaching is brilliant. He solves the big questions of who I am, what is my biggest problem. So he's a brilliant physician as well, giving the best diagnosis, commending and clarifying. A lot of our evangelism needs to be clarifying. What do we mean by God? What do we mean by gospel or Christianity? Um, so. That is understanding people's pre-understandings and responding to their questions, of course. And then, we should not neglect the role of post-evangelism uh, in terms of apologetics. Christians need this as well. Apologetics is not just for the people discussing with the atheists or for the debates. That's been kind of very much on my heart as a kind of a pastor. Uh, Christians need to be the first to discover this, need to be able to answer these questions. As we heard the story about yesterday, there was this one Christian who actually bothered to examine, right? He didn't have the answers, but he went back home and, and found the answers, helping this questioning person to find faith. So Christians need to see that their faith is true, towards water can tackle the difficult questions that is thrown at it from our culture. They should be firm in their faith. It's not just it's beautiful, but actually reliable. You know, the introduction of, of the Gospel of Luke, I've written this to you, Theophilus, so that you should know it's reliable. Okay, it's not just their choice, their life choice, the worldview choice. You can trust it. And that is the role of apologetics for Christians. And of course, it is equipping the Christians to be witnesses, apologists for the Christian faith. Okay, these, I think these are helpful perspectives when we think about apologetics um, movements, initiatives, projects. Where, where do we fit in? Do we keep the big picture here? Okay. Now, let me just quickly go into the, how these um, different aspects of our um, apologetic ministry has been influenced on the online side, right? Well, first, the higher education path, the, the communication and worldviews course, it started as hybrid education, where people met up for 
for a week, introductory week, and then went home. And we sent them uh, a letter, big envelope with a lot of pages that's summing up curriculum, a lot of reflection questions. That's the first year. That's 2001, the first year. So it's amazing how far we've gotten with, with technology. That's before email, right? That's strange, yeah. Now we're moving from this to, of course, we have online platform. All schools would have that. Now we've seen, especially through the, the COVID, that when we use online, we need to make sure we make community of it. So the interaction is crucial, not just the information uh, transfer. So we're making hybrid models with online interaction. That's happening within the higher education. Now in terms of Damaris Norway and uh, resourcing the wider Christian constituency, we, we moved from providing online archives, resources on films especially, to more kind of project to video and to online pages. It's, it's updated twice a week at least with online podcasts, videos, and interactions. So it's a lot more flexible, more media. Of course, you can do a lot more channels and so on, but this is uh, what we are able to do this far. In terms of, of even academic research, Theophilus was a uh, First, a, a simple popular magazine, then it turned into an academic one, and was paper for many years, and then it turned online, and now it's fully online access. We have an, the annual conference, which used to be only physical. Now we add online elements, so people can follow from other places. People get to know what we're doing, uh, and we make all the, like here, the lectures available online. We are want to resourcing Christians for what we bring to the conference. So the online aspect there is very important. important. And then with the, with the partnership initiatives. Um, these, these initiatives I mentioned, the imprint and so on, um, these are supplemented with online resources. So when we publish a book, we can, we can uh, on our websites, link that to a lecture by the author. We can make uh, s study guides with it, short videos, so the, the book is supported by online resources. We find this very interesting. There is a huge potential here. We kind of just open up, but we're just starting here. Now, actually, now this is landing. This is a challenge for you. This is what we've experienced, what we have received through, well, to ELF, through Christians who have partnered with us in Norway, and people and ideas that have come, come to us. Now, I suggest that you can reflect on the following. This is kind of the application, and we just, I just shape this into questions for you that could be helpful for, for reflecting on your uh, ministries. Uh, if we are all apologetics ministries, uh, in, in some ways, okay? The first one, what is your apologetic calling? Your ministry and your focus in view of the, these three contexts. Are you on pre-evangelism, using creative or any other, other means to start people interested? Or are you in direct evangelism, uh, in engaged discussions or uh, evangelizing? Or are you helping Christians discover apologetics and equipping them for sharing their faith? I think it's very helpful for us to say, say well, this is where we are, and maybe we need the others as well, right, in our setting. We shouldn't narrow um, the, the challenge to just one of these things, but we can't ourselves do all of them. Of course, what are, you, what are your potential apologetic partners? Not thinking that you should do this alone. Look around, would there be people there? Uh, of course, we need to pray this to come to life, to be actual. This is a very good place at ELF to find people to work alongside with, either in your country, but now the online world gives us very many new opportunities. 
And I uh, would encourage you also to, to make use of these uh, mentoring offers. This is a way of partnering and connecting, especially if you don't have these in your own country. What are your partners? And maybe they could have supplementary callings and arenas. Uh, and you shouldn't make everyone into the same mold, right? Uh, you should find ways of strengthening each other's callings. And then, what would be your integrative strategy? And we'd, we think that a sharp focus would be helpful and for the Veritas Conference. We, it's strengthening Christians to be uh, witnesses for Christ in a skeptical age. And then, think about the broad spectrum, reaching a, a wide group of people, or maybe, at least you think, need to think of uh, how can you use apologetic both in the, the closest in terms of argument and the invitational one and the science and art of projects, how, how is that relevant to us? And just try to reach as many as possible. possible. We need one another. I think that's one of the big lessons in, in uh, uh, this, developing this ministry in Norway. We need each other. We could never have done this ourselves and we had no idea from the start that this would be what it has become. And now we're just on the kind of, see, we're just starting to make use of the online possibilities, uh, potentials. And then I think an important uh, question for you as well, how can you start building a community of apologetic practitioners? That you're not alone, someone with, uh, which has knowledge, which cares for you, where you are held accountable as well, we heard them preaching that uh, we, need, we need to be self-critical as well. Uh, and we need both encouragement, challenge, and spiritual nourishment. If we get too busy, it's a big, big danger. And there's so many, there's so many opportunities, there's so many needs here that can very quickly <coughs> run dry. So these are suggestions of the questions you could ask yourself following from our experience in developing an, an online ministry, a projected ministry in Norway.